Well, good morning, Walden Church. Last week, we talked about holiness, and we did that because it's one of those words we say a lot, and we read it a lot, we sing about it a lot, but maybe we need to meditate on it, reflect on it some more. So today, I thought we'd look at another one. So today, we're gonna talk about glory. And then next week, on Mother's Day, we'll talk about joy. So what is glory? Or or really, what is the glory of God? You know, it's a familiar phrase. We read it in scripture. Again, it shows up in our songs, sometimes even in our language or our prayers. We might even hear ourselves say that phrase, the glory of God. Have you ever heard the phrase that sometimes familiarity breeds unfamiliarity? It's this idea that The more you hear about something, the more you see it or (laughs) sing it at Christmas time, the less we actually know about it. We read and sing about glory a lot, but can any of us describe it? Do we know what it is? The word glory is found 194 times in the Old Testament and 161 times in the New Testament. That's 355 times. This does not count the use of the word to glorify. Yet, it is greatly neglected. Charles Ryrie, in his book, Transformed by His Glory, he checked into eight standard theology books. And of the eight, he discovered that only two of them referred to the glory of God. The other six of them had nothing to say about glory, and one of them was a book he had written. The subject of glory is complex. But the essence of it, I think, is simple. Glory is a visual display of something that's appeasing to the eye, and it's awesome, so we think about it. Whatever, by its brilliance or beauty, I think it stimulates admiration. The thing has glory. For instance, if a fireworks display is really good, it's glorious because it is a visual treat. If you go through a model home and you see all the bright pleasing colors and everything so clean and fresh, you experience the glory of what an architect can build or an interior designer can create. Glory is a visual term. So what is the glory of God? You know, before Jesus was born, John the Baptist prepared the way. And he's most known for quoting Isaiah chapter 40. It says, a voice cries, In the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. There it is, the glory of the Lord. And the text says that it'll be revealed, right? That we will all see it together. Right. So, is the glory of God some bright, blinding light that will someday appear in the sky? Is the glory of God this unapproachable flame that will consume us and destroy us if we get too close? Is the glory of God this state of awe that gets brought on by nature? Is the glory of God a a church of people who love one another deeply through all everyday messiness of life and live on this side of eternity. Yeah. And if we work really hard and we do like John the Baptist says, we clear a path, we make a nice straight highway through the wasteland, we fill the valleys and level the mountains and straighten the curves and smooth out the rough places, also that the glory of God will be revealed. If we're going to do all that, then shouldn't it make sense that we would know what the glory of God is? What are we looking for? What is God's glory? And it doesn't stop here with John's announcement. The next time we see glory is the second announcement that comes at his birth with the angels. Luke 2 says, And there were shepherds living out in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord, and this will be a sign to you. You'll find a baby wrapped in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company 
of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. This is the response to the good news of Jesus' birth. It's this massive heavenly announcement. We have these beings, they are praising God and they are saying glory to God, right? Glory to God in the highest heaven, wherever, wherever that is, and, and, and on earth where we are. Peace on those to whom his favor rests. What do these two announcements mean? And what does glory to God in the highest heaven mean? We sing a lot about glory at Christmas. We see it on banners, we'll see it on a holiday card, and we are Christians, right? We are Christians. So you think that if anyone should know what glory is, we should know what it is, you know? Yeah, glory is uh, big and uh, heavenly. Okay, we probably should dig a little deeper. The word glory in the original language has a lot of nuance to it. And even though we hear a lot about it uh, from the Greek language in the church, there's a much older ancient word that is taken from the New Old Testament. And of course, that was written in Hebrew. So we're going to look at the Old Testament first. Psalm 19 says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. So what is glory? Well, according to Psalm 19, maybe it has something to do with the sky. What does that mean? Well, have you ever been walking outside on a clear night and someone said, hey, look up, and then you do, and the sky is just full of stars? Maybe you go out to the desert, or you go camping, or you go fishing, and the night sky looks very different than the one that's above your house. What do you see when you look up? I mean, the stars, yes, but it's also the heavens, the galaxies, the supernovas, the planets, the solar system, all of it gives us this huge sense of, wow, right? Everything's so big, everything's so massive, everything's so mysterious, it just, just takes your breath away. We're lucky enough that we also get to look through very powerful telescopes and we get to take pictures of things that are 180,000 light years away. And we can't understand that. Your brain cannot understand how there's an object that's 180,000 light years away and you can see it. Or the other, uh, you know, astronomers will tell you, oh, this, this, this galaxy is 200,000 light years across. Across? We can't understand that. Psalm 19 says God's holiness is kind of like our word for, wow, (laughs) right? Glory is something big, it's massive, it's huge, and it makes you just stop and stare and you are dumbstruck. The Hebrew word for glory in Psalm 19 is kavod, which means weight. It means heavy, but it also means mysterious. It comes from the word of seeing a rich person who is loaded down with riches. It's all of those things. Psalm 19 says, the heavens declare the weight and the majesty and the wealth and the abundance of God. Other things in life may remind us of lightness, right? Of of, of breath, of wind, of how fleeting things are. Some things don't have permanence. Some things come and go, but kavod, glory, is deep and weighted and sparkly. Kavod is the reminder that when we look up, we are small and insignificant. And we recognize our proper place in the grand scheme of things, and we get a glimpse of all of it when we stare at the heavens. You get a glimpse of the kavod of God in the sky. What else? Well, in another part of the Old Testament, uh, God tells tells Moses to go lead the people out of Egypt, right? And take them to freedom. And Moses questioned this whole idea. He says, well, you know, who am I to do this? And he said, you know, what, what authority do I carry? Why would Pharaoh believe me? And so Moses asks God 
to reveal himself. Exodus 33, the Lord said to Moses, I will do the very same thing you have asked because I am pleased with you and I know you by name. Then Moses said, show me your glory. In other words, right? Show, show me your kavod. And the Lord said, I will cause all of my goodness, so wait, not glory, to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face for no one can see me and live. Now, not the same thing. Moses asked to see the glory of God. God said, no, I will let my goodness, not my glory, pass by you, and I will show you compassion. In other words, what you're asking for is too great. Nobody can view my glory. I, I will spare you from my glory. I will give compassion to you instead, and, then, and instead I will only reveal my goodness. So there's something about God's glory that was too much for Moses to look at. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. And when my glory, right, my kavod, my weight, my significance passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back but my face must not be seen. You know, the Hebrew rabbis have a uh, understanding that the phrase, see my back, is a Hebrew euphemism for to see the spot where I just was. Moses says, show me your kavod, and God says, you can't handle it. The best you can handle is I'll allow you to look at the spot where I was just standing. God says, how can I show you my glory? When you look up at the stars, you have to stop and catch your breath. So if that blows you away, you certainly can't handle the weight of who I am. Instead, I will just show you the spot where I just was. God's glory is awe and it's reverence of who he is, how big he is, and how small we are. The heavens above, they're this gift that reminds us of our place, our size, to give us a glimpse of the weight and scale and mystery and scope of God. This is who you are, and this is the kavod of God. People sing about glory, we write poems about glory, it's beauty, it's mystery, it's size, it's proportion, and I think we need those reminders in our songs, don't we? In fact, we probably need more reminders of his glory, more reminders that we are small, more reminders that he is great. First Chronicles 16 says, Sing to the Lord all the earth, proclaim his salvation day after day, declare his glory among the nations, his marvelous deeds among all peoples. For great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods, for all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and joy are his dwelling place. Ascribe to the Lord. In other words, give to God. All you families of nations, ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory. Do his name. Bring an offering and come before him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of his holiness. Tremble before him all the earth. The world is firmly established. It cannot be moved. Let the heavens rejoice. Let the earth be glad. Let them say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Listen, you can have all the money. You can have everything that this world has to offer. But if you don't have the awe, the reverence, the respect, the honor due towards God, you will be unbelievably empty. Chronicle says, ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due him. You can chase after everything the world offers, but if you don't stop and look up and admit that you are not the center of the universe, you will keep chasing hollow and empty and temporary things. The world wants to keep your nose to the grindstone, to keep you chasing fame, chasing fortune, but worldly fame and worldly fortune are so incredibly small. And that is when 
We'll chase after new. Chase after sparkly, and it never satisfies. The wind blows, it is fleeting, and it always leaves us wanting more. So it is not lost on me that the city neon lights and the street lamps block out the stars. It's a metaphor. All those strip malls and security lights, they are so bright that we can't see the stars. You know, we make something and we think, oh wow, that has significance but it blocks our view of the weight and the majesty of God. The new sometimes blocks the ancient, and we end up ascribing glory to the wrong things. The Hebrew scholars had another thought about glory, and it isn't just that God has weight and significance, but also about who God gives glory to. Psalm 8 says, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. You have set your glory above the heavens. Through the praise of his children and infants, you've established a stronghold against your enemies to silence the foe and the avenger. When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what are mere mortals that you are mindful of them, human beings that you care for them? You have made them a little lower than the angels and crowned them with glory and honor. So God has kavod but he has crowned human beings with it as well. That is a high view of humanity. Why did God do this? You made them rulers over the works of your hands, right? The world, the environment. You put everything under their feet, all flocks and herds and the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim the paths of the seas. Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Who has God given glory to? Who has God given part of his glory to? Us, right? Us, human beings. We have been given glory for the reason that we can co-create, co-author, co-manage the world with God. Psalm says that he made us rulers. In other words, God has a very high opinion of you. We, we've each been given gifts. So we should be using our glory to partner with God and to co-create, to garden, to nurture, to heal right along with him, right? But look at what the prophet Jeremiah says. Has a nation ever changed its gods? Yet they are not gods at all, but my people have exchanged their glorious God for worthless idols. Be appalled at this, you heavens, and shudder with great horror, declares the Lord. God says, my people were created to do glorious things in the world, but they have traded that in. They're distracted. They could have been so much more, but they were distracted and they have missed out on all the things that I have intended for them. So, God is glory, right? He's given that part of that glory to us so that we can work with him, but we get distracted and we chase after worthless things. We're on the same page. Let's go back to the Christmas story. This is the New Testament, book of Luke, written in Greek. Remember, the angel said, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So the Greek writers have to now have a word for glory. They can't use kavod. They have to use a Greek word. They use the word doxa. The Greek word doxa means brilliance, like the sun, like the stars, but it also means thought or opinion or to consider something. So doxa is God's brilliance, but it's also the way God sees things. It's the way God thinks about things. And if God sees something that way, if God thinks about something that way, then it must be that way. Doxa is God's true thought. It's his opinion. In other words, it's true. If, right? You and I, on the other hand, we have a very fluttering opinion. Our feelings are fleeting. For us, 
you know, how, how we see things shifts. Our thoughts, they're, they're all over the place. But God is who he has always been, and his glory is how things are. Just like the stars in the sky, they, they are up there. They are there. You just can't see them all the time. In our reality, our world, we can't always see them. We turn off the street lights and we look up, then we see the heavens and we see it for how it really is. Doxa says that. Doxa says we need to see the night sky as it truly is. We need to see the heavens as God sees them. We need to see our lives as they truly are. Who we truly are. People who are made in his image. In his glory. You and I, you and I have an invitation to see God and to see the things that he has created. And if our opinion and our actions line up with God, then it's God's glory because that is the way God sees things too. That's the way God wants it. And I think when we tap into that, we tap into that way that it should be life. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? When we see things as they truly are, that's when everything feels right. What do I mean? I mean, when we hear certain stories and they resonate with us, you know, they line up with how God sees the world too. And we, we hear those stories and we tear up because they move us, because they're true and they're right. Why, you know, we, we talked about Christmas earlier. Why does, why does Christmas move us? The reason why Christmas moves us, even even non-believers, right? It's not just Christians, even non-believers. We can watch a Christmas movie about the, the Christmas spirit and, and even the most stubborn Grinch wells up with emotion. How Christmas changes us to be nice and giving and generous, even though the rest of the year, we're not always nice people. Christmas reminds us of God's glory. It reveals God's doxa, how things should be. Christmas reminds us that there is a purpose for us, and we know that there's potential for who we could be, and that we were made for something more, which means subsequently the rest of the year, we have misused our strengths and our gifts. We have forgotten our passions and our songs. The other days of the year, we have exchanged our glorious God for worthless idols. And on Christmas, we say things like, I wish it could be like this all year long. I wish every day could be Christmas. Why do we say that? Why, why do we say that? Because the rest of the year, our actions and lives chase after temporary and meaninglessness. If we live in artificial light, then it is blocking out the heavens. So every day we live in this tension of being crowned in God's glory, but not always living up to it. So Paul gives us some advice about how to live up to it. He says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We may know this verse, heard it before, maybe even memorized it, but do you know what? It's the next verse that we should have learned as well. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. Paul goes on in the next verse and he says, practice this, practice this and the God of peace will be with you. In other words, focus your life on the glorious and then you will reflect the glorious. In that encounter with God, Moses became radiant with the glory of God. The Bible says he had to wear a veil because his skin was glowing. You know how long Moses was with God? 40 days. 40 days. That's it. Man. What would we look like if we could spend 41 days 
with God? What would be the effect on us if we strive to live in God's glory for 41 years? Focus your life on the glorious and you will reflect the glorious. You know what else? Jesus prays for your glory. He prays for it. In John 17, Jesus prays, Father, I desire that they also, whom you have given me, may be with me where I am to see my glory that you have given me because you loved me before the foundation of the world. Remember, I said that glory was a visual term. John the Baptist speaks of Jesus' glory, and the angels speak of Jesus' glory, and Jesus speaks of his glory. And Jesus is the God made visible. Glory is God's love made visible. So love and glory must be linked together because anything you love, you will glorify. Anything you love, you will glorify. Matthew 22, Jesus says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. We are told to love him with all our hearts, with all our minds, with our soul. And when we do this, we share in his glory. We reflect it. The diamond glorifies the sun. It reflects its glory. We reflect the Son of God. Right? We glorify him when we reflect him. Matthew 5, 14, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. The whole idea of being a light to the world is to glorify Jesus. And we do that by reflecting the light of his love to a dark world. The book of Psalms says, those who look at him are radiant. This is the way God's people have always glorified him. God would turn his face toward them. He would shine on them like the sun and they would look to his face and become radiant and they would reflect that love to the world. The more we look at the glory of God, the more we will radiate his glory. The more we will radiate his love. When the first church experienced the glory of God at Pentecost, they didn't just say, all right, good night, going home, going back to my normal life. No, they emerged from that place as different from the rest of the world because they carried the light and they were going out into a dark world. They went out and they started turning the world upside down for Jesus. They preached the gospel. They worked miracles. They did signs. They did wonders. And the Lord added daily to their number. That is the glory that we should be operating in. And those early Christians They were no different than you. Those first believers, they received the same spirit you did. They got baptized with the same Holy Spirit. Christians today are the same as the ones of yesteryear. We carry God's glory. So, to increase the amount of glory in your life, you must increase the amount of love in your life. Put simply, more love, more glory. The spirit of strife and division, that'll always be there. It lurks and it looks for an opening, looks for a way to get into your life. Never let your love down. Then you are on your way to being filled with his glory. You are the light of the world. You are radiant and he has crowned you with his glory. Let's pray. Father God, this world on all of it is yours and I am yours. We are yours. Forgive us when we believe the world revolves around us or it's our needs or our wants, or our goals, or our desires. 
This is your world and we are yours. We are your church. And it is our job to be a light. But it is your light that the world sees, not our own. We are to reflect your glory and your Son. So each and every day, help us to make every effort to live at peace with everyone, to love our neighbor as ourself, to love our enemy, to heap burning coals upon their head as our Jesus instructs us, and to shine like the sun, to be in the light as you are the light. You are glorious, Father God. Glory to you in heaven and on earth. Amen. Well, we want to thank you so much for coming out and sharing this morning with us. I'm so glad to see you guys here. As always, you can always uh, like this video, subscribe to this channel, follow us, make sure that you're getting all the information uh, by following us on social media, whether it's Facebook or Twitter. Uh, we have all those options for you. Instagram, we have that as well, plus our, our own uh, WaldenChurch.com. You can always visit that to get the latest. Uh, we're at the office till 3 p.m. every single day, so if you ever want to call us, uh, or stop by, we would always love a visit. And we got two services every Sunday, one at 9.30 with the choir. It's a traditional service. We're gonna sing hymns, we're gonna have communion, we're gonna say the Lord's Prayer, do responsive readings. It's everything you remember church uh, when you were growing up. We also have an 11 o'clock service, which is our contemporary service. And we have a full children's program from birth all the way through high school during that hour as well. Come casual, we'd love to see you. We'd love to be the church where you live. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.